We stay with events in Zimbabwe and now a CCTV footage has emerged showing the alleged abduction of activist Tawanda Mchewa in Bulawayo. He was abducted in broad daylight in July and was reportedly tortured for three days. The footage, uh, which we will start to analyze in a few moments, was obtained by a Zimbabwean journalist and shows Mchewa's abductors emerging from a white pickup truck and later bundling him into the same car, which then sped off and was followed by another white van. Well, it's, it's since emerged that the baki used in the abduction was hired from a Harare car rental company. And the footage later shows uh, two cars stopping uh, down the uh, road and Mchewa being transferred into the other vehicle. Uh, while all of this is coming to the fore, and this is the first time we're seeing uh, possibly hard evidence of uh, abductions uh, taking place in the country, uh, President Emerson Mnangagwa has dismissed allegations of abductions. He's reportedly accused civic society organizations and the opposition uh, to, of staging abductions to paint a bad picture of his government. Well, for more on this, uh, let's now speak to Zimbabwean journalist and uh, media professional Edmund Kudzai, and uh, he'll talk us through uh, some of this footage and uh, what it means uh, showing how uh, Tawanda Mchewa was abducted. Edmund, thanks very much indeed for joining us. Uh, welcome to the program. Um, I, I suppose if we start at the beginning, most people want to know because the authorities probably will say, is this footage authentic? Well, uh, that question does not arise because the footage uh, is authentic for a number of reasons. Uh, first of all, the vehicles that you see in the footage end up at the police station because while four of these individuals are abducted or arrested at the same time, three of them are then taken to uh, the police and are charged whereas Tawanda is then bundled into, as you saw in the video footage, into the Isuzu and later transferred into the Ford Ranger, which then takes him to be tortured. So the question of uh, whether or not um, the video uh, is, is, is authentic doesn't arise because the vehicles ended up at the police station. The police do not deny that. They don't deny that they charged the other three. And then a few days later, there was a habeas corpus uh, application which was granted by consent after the police agreed that they had arrested uh, Tawanda. And um, it was granted by consent. The police would have no reason uh, to consent to that order if they didn't, um, if they didn't have, have, have it. So the, the footage is authentic. Uh, I understand that from Juduzi, Zoom Live is going to be posting the original because what you're looking at is the compressed version of perhaps two hours of footage which had to be analyzed. But I understand it's going to be posting the raw cameras. I think there were four or three cameras involved on that building, uh, fortunately on the day which, uh, which captured uh, uh, the abduction. So whether, whether or not the, the footage is real is, is not a question that even arises. Even the government has not disputed uh, that uh, that is real. All right, let's talk about the footage itself, because I guess it was uh, a little bit fortunate that there was a business that had uh, the CCTV mounted for security reasons at that exact spot. Uh, take us through how difficult it was perhaps um, getting this footage together and also starting to analyze, because for some of us, all you see is cars going up and down. Well, I think uh, the, it was made a bit easier because you had four people, or at least three people. Uh, the, 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 there are some questions which I won't get into about one of the parties involved who's believed to have been um, a spy who actually brought these guys there. But you have at least uh, three people there who were able to explain what was happening. That's the first thing. So that really helped. And then as well, the, the camera was in such a position that it captured uh, all the actions. and. Uh, after zooming into it, it was pretty clear what was going on. And because you had individuals who had been part of that, they were then explaining uh, what was happening at that particular time. So it became a lot easier to join that footage together and understand what was going on because we also had the assistance of, uh, of the individuals who were involved in the, in the incident. All right. So take us through the sequence itself. 
uh, Tendai, with other people in the car, arrived at a hardware store. Were they being followed or did these vehicles come at a later stage? Talk us through that. Uh, they don't believe that they were being followed. And uh, the sequence of events, uh, the individual that I'm referring, uh, referring to and choosing not to, to name, uh, suddenly found themselves as uh, part of that trip after they volunteered to go. So they, they asked to go and they left their own vehicle and they brought in some protest flyers, which they later dropped in the car. And uh, the suspicion is that uh, this lady was, um, was there to lead these guys to them. So they knew where to go because she probably was in contact with them because they did not get uh, any indication that they were followed. In any case, uh, the manner in which um, the trip arose was, was sudden and unplanned in such a way that it would have been quite difficult for the security services to be, to be tracking them. It was, a, it was an almost spontaneous trip. And how many vehicles were involved in the end? Five vehicles at least. Uh, there's a Nissan uh, Baiki there, an MP300, which behaves suspiciously. Um, we weren't able to determine whether or not it was uh, part of the abduction. But the manner in which the vehicle stops, uh, it has no intention of uh, getting to the hardware store. Uh, it just parks there, and just before the guy gets abducted, it drives off and turns, uh, and turns right. And then, I guess, a stroke of luck, you got the registration plate on the footage as well. Yes, that, that really was um, a stroke of luck because they'd removed uh, the, the registration plates from the back of the vehicle. But um, the number was caught, I think it's uh, camera number two of the CCTV, as they turned and uh, managing to pull into that footage and move back and forth through it, we were able to determine with certainty uh, that it was AES 2433, I think. Uh, and the Ford Range, uh, further investigations through ZimLive. Uh, the bulk of the work has been done by, uh, by ZimLive. Um, and uh, the person who was abducted is the nephew uh, of the editor of ZimLive. Um, so once we managed to determine that, to determine that ZimLive managed to get information on who owned the vehicle. Uh, they managed to get the contact details of the person who owned the vehicle, and they spoke to him. And he said uh, he had no idea the car had uh, been uh, leased to a car hire company um, in the, at the time in question. So then he got in touch with Impala Car Rental, which, which has, um, it all, the company also has a modest operation in South Africa, uh, Impala Car Hire. So he, get, he got in touch with the proprietor, and the proprietor said, yes, the vehicle was, um, was hired by one of our regular customers. Uh, but I can't disclose the name of the customer. The police would have to come and will volunteer uh, mm. the information to the police. So as it is now, Impala Car Rental would know the name of that, uh, uh, that, that individual. And what have the police done so far? Have they asked for the footage? Have they even started an inquiry? No, the police have not... Um, the police have not asked for, for the footage. Uh, they don't uh, seem particularly exercised uh, by the abduction. Uh, I understand that uh, there were efforts today to, to reach out to the police uh, to find out on the status of that vehicle because this, this, this video has been released for at least 36 hours now. And the police would have had an opportunity to view it because it's been viewed hundreds of thousands of times in different uh, social media platforms. But the police, uh, when, uh, when uh, the police spokesman was contacted today, he says, well, no, we actually haven't uh, dealt with that case at, uh, at national level, uh, speak to Blayo. Uh, so we got in touch with uh, Blayo. And uh, the man in charge says, well, I can't comment on that now, be back in the office on, on Monday. So that, that behavior is not consistent uh, with an enthusiastic police force that's uh, eager to solve a crime. You would think that every hour that passes is crucial. People could be destroying evidence. People might be trying to cross the border. That's what, how the police would behave if it was a different case. But in this particular instance, the police already know who the abductors were because they dropped off three of uh, 
the abductees that Blawa, your central police station. So the police know there's no need for investigation. They already know who it is because the guy dropped off, uh, uh, the guy dropped off three of his uh, victims at the police station and dropped off their vehicle. Uh, it's all captured uh, in the video. They actually come back to, uh, because initially when they're taken, they have to leave their truck, uh, the guy who'd come up with the back, uh, with the backy. And they say, look, I left the keys in the ignition. The things are unsecured. So they said, okay, we'll take you back so that you can load up your stuff and we bring you back. And you can see them coming back and loading the car in the video. Then they go back to the police. So why would the police investigate when they know exactly who it is who surrendered those three people? And after they admitted to the court when the habeas corpus uh, um, order was granted, it was granted by consent. Uh, was granted by consent. So there's, there's no talk of investigation. In any case, while this has been captured on video, and um, there's, 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 there's been uh, names that have been published by former government officials, and uh, one particular individual who's pictured there, his picture has been posted there. I understand that the victims have identified him positively. Uh, he, he's not come out to say, I'm being accused of this uh, terrible crime. I'm innocent. This is my alibi. I know mm. nothing about what you're talking about. The guy is absolutely quiet. And that's not how, if you found your name plastered in newspapers accused of abducting and torturing people, You'd be screaming your innocence. We haven't heard a word from you. You know, uh, what do, guessing, guessing what, why. What do we know about this crew? Is it that something that they may have done before? Is something that they do regularly? <coughs> well, no, it's a daily sport. It's a daily sport. Uh, in February, uh, in January 2019, uh, there was a sudden a dramatic fuel price increase. And um, it triggered mass protests. And uh, there was a, a vicious clampdown. And uh, during that period of a few weeks, uh, at least seven people were killed. Dozens of women of, were raped and hundreds were viciously beaten. And at the time, the government says, oh, we, we, we have no idea who's doing these terrible things. It must be a third force. Uh, but then they made a mistake because in, in February, a team of 10 military uh, intelligence and uh, police uh, were out there doing what they do every day, beating up people. So they targeted a bar in Bari, and they beat up the patrons and they robbed the bar. But the mistake they made is that the bar belonged to a military officer, and he managed to conduct investigations and find out who they were. So they got arrested. So when they get arrested, one of the guys, Sergeant Mishosho, in his warned and st cautioned statement, he says, this the information is available. He says, uh, I was ordered to harass members of the opposition. That's what he said. He said it's straight. Now, the system panicked and realized that, well, this guy is threatening to expose them if we prosecute. So the prosecutor general's uh, office uh, withdrew, withdrew the charges and said, we'll proceed by way of summons. Uh, it's been one and a half years. It's been more than one and a half years. Nothing has happened. So the police will not investigate. The system will not investigate because it can't investigate it, uh, itself. The government is using violence and uh, intimidation to subdue the population. And the evidence is, um, is there to see now in the video. We also have the evidence from 2019 where the same Ferris team was caught but released. Uh, these are serious crimes. You can't imagine that you'd have such a case of security personnel involved in a robbery and um, an assault of patrons at a bar, and the state hasn't prosecuted them in one and a half years. There's clearly no interest in prosecuting them because the moment you prosecute them, the next time there's a protest or the next time the population is complaining that is hungry and you ask the military or the intelligence services to go and beat them up, they'll say, no, thank you. We don't want to end up in jail. So there's no way that the system will investigate itself because they desperately need the security services to subdue the population. And the moment you start prosecuting them, they will refuse to cooperate because they'll say we're afraid to go to jail. It's the only reason why the government is refusing to comment on the CCTV footage because well, they know they've been caught. They know the individuals involved have been identified. President, of course, there's, President uh, there's an opportunity for... Yeah. President yes. Mnangagwa has said that there is no evidence of abductions and tortures. 
Is this evidence that's uh, before us now irrefutable and concrete proof that abductions are taking place and that they are sponsored by the state? Yes, it is, 100%, because the video shows these individuals who are arrested by we do they are actually, but then those persons take them to the police station, something mm. that the police do not dispute. So these individuals are connected to the state because I, I can't go about arresting people and dropping them off at the police station. I'll probably get arrested myself. So these individuals are clearly linked to the state. They are known to the police. Um, so there's no doubt about it. The evidence is, is clear. That the young man involved, Tawanda Mchehi, was badly beaten. Uh, he's, um, he's, he's currently using uh, a catheter. Uh, his kidney function is diminished. He was badly uh, bruised. Uh, the images are, are terrible. Now, uh, the president's spokesperson asked about this issue. He says, well, no, this is actually a conspiracy by the opposition, which is trying to topple the government. So he volunteered himself to be beaten up. Uh, speaking earlier today on Twitter, the president's uh, spokesperson is talking about an MDC councillor who, uh, who was found dead, suspected to have been um, killed by the state. The police say they're investigating. And uh, he, he speaks about him in such disparaging terms. He says, oh, the guy was drunk on village, uh, village beer. Won't bring back his life no matter how loud you complain. Now, this is, this is a government that's thrown away any pretense at upholding the rule of law. They're showing the population that we are in control. And if we want to take you out, we'll take you out. And if we can't take you out, we'll put you in prison. And we've got people in prison now. So are we saying that the uh, judiciary, the justice system, is also captured by the same people that are doing the abductions and the harassment of uh, activists? Yes, and I'll illustrate the manner in which the capture operates. There's a member of parliament who was recently arrested for his crime was he gave two ladies uh, two face masks um, which were written uh, ZANU PF must go. So he was arrested. It's, it's absurd. You would think he would not get arrested. But you assume, okay, there's, there's a small problem here. And he's not the only one. We also have Kurawone who's... Um, currently in prison, accused of undermining the authority of the president. And that's, that means uh, saying, uh, saying things about the president that he doesn't, he, doesn't, he doesn't like. So these guys get arrested, they go to the police station. If you had a reasonably competent police force, they would say, well, this is not a crime. Uh, there's nothing wrong with someone criticizing the president. But no, the, these individuals are, uh, are arrested and they're taken to court. Now, when you get to court, uh, the prosecutor's office will vet all the cases that the police are bringing in. Now, you would think that a prosecutor with an LLB would look at this and think, wow, this is an absurdity. Sorry, you made a mistake. But they look at it. They know it's wrong, but they know it's political. They don't want to be the one who stops the political case. So uh, the person vet vetting it will allow the case to go through. Then you get to a magistrate. Now, surely you should be safe in the magistrate's court. Uh, these are men of justice. You get to the magistrate's court, you would assume that when the, uh, the state is applying to, 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 to remand you, the magistrate would look at the case and say, why would um, speaking uncharitably about the president be considered an offense and throw it out and refuse to remand you? But even the magistrate will remand you on an, on a, on an absurd case. Then they'll deny you bail. And then they'll keep you, give you the legal runaround for one and a half, two months, three months, as long as they want. So the entire system is captured because the chief justice could very easily issue a directive and say this piece of legislation is inconsistent, is inconsistent with the Constitution. We will not be prosecuting these cases. We won't be demanding them. But they don't do that because they want to use that tool to intimidate and subdue the population and prevent the population from complaining. All right. You know, we're running out of time, but um, this is a question that I asked you a little bit earlier on. And 
I asked you because I understand the challenges. We see what's happened to Hopewell Chinono. Uh, he says that all he did was to write and expose corruption. The authorities say that uh, no, he was inciting violence and that's why he's in jail. And we've talked to other journalists who say they live in fear. And I just wonder, doing this interview, is this something that puts you on somebody's radar? Um, could you be fearful? And I know that you have some history with uh, Zimbabwean authorities, uh, having had uh, moments in jail yourself. Well, obviously, every journalist who actually wants to do any serious journalism will be concerned for their safety. Because uh, ZANU-PF, the government, could kill me today. People would make noise on it for four days. But that will be the end of it. They've done it before. We've got examples of that. So, yes, naturally we're concerned. But at some point to take a position and say, well, let them do what they'll do. Uh, we need to do our job. So, yes, the Mututu Matutu right now is publishing from hiding. Mm. Matutu is in hiding. What crime has he committed? He's in hiding because he's afraid for his life. And no person should live in a country, in their own country, and be afraid of their own government. That at night, men in masks, can come and bang down your door and rape your wife and your children and then blow your brains out. It's completely unacceptable. And people have decided to speak out. And um, we see what happens after that.